Welcome, and thank you for joining us here at Commitment Online, a place for all nations. We want you to fully engage with us, so feel free to gather your family, invite a friend, or if you're alone, we trust that you'll have a wonderful worship experience with us today. Our worship service will begin in just a few minutes. Church, you are a flower planted and rooted and blooming by the living water, a river that never runs dry, but runs over and over and then some. 
Church, you are not easily tossed by the winds or scorched by the enemy's schemes. You will not be overcome by the floods of life, but by the blood of Christ that flows with salvation. Stand in that affirmation and use it to walk as an example to lead and equip others for ministry to develop maturity and attain unity we need you God he wants you to build up the body you are needed to edify and glorify his holy name as one for even the rocks cry out the birds and trees praise. Why won't you? What are you waiting for? People are lost. People are dying. What are you waiting for? Church, we are all in this garden together. So upon you let the sun shine. He is a perfect light.
You're holy, yes, you're holy. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, you're holy. Sing it one more time. Say, holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me.
The church is not the building. We are the church. We're a building made without hands. We are the transformed people of God. A people created to go, a people created to grow, a people created to multiply. We are a people who can never stop going with the gospel, growing through the gospel, and multiplying the gospel of Jesus Christ into the next generation. This is the purpose of the church. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here in your presence and, and to celebrate you, Jesus, our King. You're the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and you are the reason why we gather today as the church. And Lord, I pray that you just help me to help your people. God, I pray you just settle my heart and mind in the hearts and minds of your people. I pray that you remove any barriers or hindrances to our ability to hear from you today. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will till the soils of the hearts of your people through the power of your Holy Spirit and even the hearts of those who may not know you today or may hear this message decades from now. God, I pray that you will prepare hearts to hear exactly what you have designed and that uh, your word will fall on good ground and bear much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So if you're here for the first time, uh, we thank you for joining us and also catching up with us as it relates to our sermon series, series, which we've entitled Ecclesiology, which is simply the theological study of the church. Um, and who's the church we've been learning? First of all, it's not a place, it's not a building, but is, it is the church is the people, Right? Uh, it is the people of God, those called out ones, that remnant that still remains on this earth to ultimately advance the kingdom of God, proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to all nations and tribes and tongues. We are the church. That being said, the church, where church comes from, a Greek word called ekklesia. Thus, we get uh, the, the title of our message, ecclesiology. Uh, the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, combined with ology, the study of, Right? the study of ecclesiology, the study of the church. So that being said, uh, the church, those of us who have put our faith and trust in Christ, we have a responsibility. And one of the responsibilities we've been learning is that we got to grow deeper. We have to grow deeper in our personal relationship with the head of the church, who is Christ, right? We can't just come to know Christ and just exist day to day without really growing in an intimate relationship with Christ, the head of the church. So our challenge is to become better equipped so we can uh, go as far as he has so designed us individually and collectively as a church. Because remember, uh, the responsibility of the church is to go to our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. But we have to be a people who are ready to what? Go. We have to grow be deep in him so we can go as far as he has so designed for us to go. And this is what I've been trying to hammer home in this series as well, into the next generation. Okay, some of you may be teenagers today. Some of you may be young adults today. At the end of the day, uh, what we do today, okay, impacts you into the next generation, even uh, to children yet unborn. So we need to grow Theologically, we need to grow spiritually. We need to even, we're going to learn next week, multiply numerically because think about it. If you don't multiply numerically, what happens to the church? Two differences between Lisa and my family is this, is that I was born one of eight. She was born one of one. Just do math, Right? And that's part of even a conversation we have in our, in our context is that, wow, she says, I don't have many cousins. Only, matter of fact, I have a, one more aunt left. You follow me? So, but my parents had multiple siblings, which has now given us multiple cousins upon cousins upon cousins. It's not so with Lisa. It's no different with the body of Christ. Locally, meaning us, 
If we don't multiply, guess what happens? We die out. And there's a lot of churches, local churches, that are dying out because they choose not to grow spiritually, relationally with Christ, and also multiply themselves into the next generation. Makes sense. And I'm sure you can ride by many of churches today and see them boarded up and are not existing are just existing for themselves and unto themselves. Make sense? So our challenge is, is to be a church to, that reaches into the next generation, all ultimately for his glory, not for our name on our building, not for our own personal uh, glory, but ultimately for the glory of the one who is the head of the church. So today, we're going to continue with what Larry uh, shared with you last week. Is, and the question is, what is then the purpose of the church? The purpose of the church, we've defined three key uh, nuances. The first is this, we're created to go, right, into all the world, but we're also created to grow and we're created to multiply. Today, we're going to dig deeper into uh, created to grow, that we should be a growing church and a growing church that is growing in oneness, which you see thematically uh, in the text we're going to look at in Ephesians. We need to be a church that is growing in oneness, and therefore, there's this working of the parts of the body that enables the church to be one mind, right? One purpose, ultimately to accomplish everything that the one head has assigned for us. Make sense? So if you can open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verses 1 through 6. And we need to first dive into, as like a foundation to today's message, that we must be a church that is growing in oneness, growing in oneness. And we've been blessed to be a church of many races and cultures, right? Even uh, generations. And I think this is uh, emphatically important to us because you can, you can approach, you know, different things because we're so different, different ways, right? But at the end of the day, there's one way that God has designed the church which is so beautiful because it causes people from all nations and tribes and tongues to land on the same mind, the same heart, the same purpose. Make sense? So again, if you look at Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse number 1, it says this, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are also called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now, there's one word that you hear over and over again, and is that one, the word one, right? There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, which should tell us what? We are what? One. I mean, it's like, sometimes when you study the Bible, it is that simple, all right? But let's dig deeper. So when you look at this church that should be growing in oneness, there's about three things I've identified in these passages. The fir first uh, is this, in verse number one, uh, a church growing in oneness is a church with people walking in their salvation. Have you ever walked with some friends and one friend chooses to cross the street? Just randomly, like, like why are you over there? Have you, ever, have you ever had that friend, right? It's like, why are you, we're on this side of the street, why are you walking over there? <laughs> or maybe you're that friend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? It's like, like, why are you walking? Everybody is here and you choose to just walk randomly over there. Similarly, you find the church trying to operate the same way, right? You have someone who professes to know Christ, professes to be saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ, but chooses to walk by the beat of their own drum. Just do things their own way. It, it, is, it causes dysfunction in the church 
So the first thing we need to land on is, are we willing to be a people who walk in our salvation? It says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. The word walk means this, to regulate one's life or to conduct yourself. We cannot be a group of people who says, well, I'm going to conduct myself this way, and I'm going to conduct myself this way. There's one Bible, there's one Lord, there's one Spirit who guides all people. No matter what age you are, no matter what, if you're a man or a woman, no matter if you're black, white, pink, purple, or any nationality, there is one salvation and one way all people must walk. And when we do that, we walk in step of the spirit. You follow me? And it causes a oneness because there's agreement to it. Make sense? So there's then this walking in this calling. This calling is this divine invitation to embrace salvation. So think about this. In any healthy growing church, there should be new people who don't understand the walk. Well, how do I walk? Well, I walk in what this divine calling. I must first embrace salvation. If I don't even embrace my salvation that is in Christ, I will be out of step. So if there's someone here today who's not sure about their salvation and you're like, man, I want to get involved in this church thing and I want to be able to see my life transform, one of the first things you must do to grow in oneness or be a part of a community is choose to submit to the head of the church and that is Christ and Christ alone. Is to admit that you're a sinner, confess that before the head of the church, pray and ask him to save you and transform your life and immediately you're in step. Immediately you're in step. But then those of us who've already prayed that simple prayer and have acknowledged him as Lord and Savior, there then is a life-going choice. Will I regulate my life to conduct myself with the beat of his drum? Secondly, we are people showing tolerance. So we walk together, but we also show tolerance because there, there will be that random person who just crosses the street. And the human tendency is like, <laughs> it's like, you just keep tripping, right? You just, something's wrong with you, and I don't want to deal with you because you are a pain. And that just like any biological family happens to the family of God, is that every now and then we become pains and frustrating points and tension points and rubbing points to each other, but there's this responsibility as we're walking towards oneness and salvation, we are showing tolerance to one another. The word showing tolerance means this, to sustain, bear, and endure one another in love. So think about this. It is sustained. Sometimes you just have to make it happen. It's uncomfortable, it's frustrating. I don't like you today. You make me mad today, but I'm still gonna walk with you. Right? I'm gonna walk with you. But it also means to bear because there's sometimes people are just going through and they're struggling to walk in a way that is worthy of the calling. And our responsibility is to bear that person up help carry them and bring them along. And then you see it also is defined this way, to endure. Because there is something about endurance when you're in step in salvation with one another. You just have to endure things. Endure things together. Endure things together and not give up on each other, right? So walk in their salvation, a show tolerance, and then you also see this. Uh, in the showing of tolerance, is done in what? Humility, right? Because you know that one day you may need help. So humility says, I'm willing to uh, help you in spite of you because, you know, one day I may need help in spite of me. Which leads to the third and final point when it comes to growing in oneness. You find in verses 3 through 5 that we must be people that are consciously and intentionally preserving unity. It's just, you know what? If we have a disagreement, if we are frustrated with each other, I am with every fiber within me 
I'm going to be diligent to make sure we get along. The words being diligent you find here, it means this, to be hastened, to be hasten in your decision. In other words, I will hastenly make sure that we get along. I won't just let months and weeks and years pass on and then we grow further and further and further apart. No, if I feel as though that we're out of step with each other, I will hasten to reconcile. I will hasten to make it right. Right? Some of you know what I'm talking about because some of you probably don't like some of your family members, biological family members. Some of you probably haven't even spoken to your parents in a while. And they are your blood. If you could do it with blood, nah, it's so easy. That's why people go from church to 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 church. That's why, believe it or not, one of the main reasons for church planting and church People starting churches, you know why? I don't agree with this, so I go over here and start my own thing. That's how denominationalism started. I don't like what you do, so I just go over here and do what I want to do. Versus saying, maybe we should hasten to get along with each other. Right? And let not our hurt and our pains grow so deep to a point that we just find ourselves drifting apart. The word diligent also means to exert oneself, to endeavor, to give diligence. You hear those words, those descriptives that says, you know what? If you feel that you are out of step with a brother or sister, it is your responsibility to preserve unity. The word preserve means this, to tend to it carefully or to take care of. So it's almost like saying there will be times that you have to respond and and just be the one who just takes care of it. Just make sure that you see if you're in a meeting or you're, you're in relationship with someone and that person's name keeps coming up in a negative way. Take care of it. And I'm sure we've all experienced that. And this is how creative it gets in the church. Hey, well, you know. Can you pray for so and so? Because really, what you're saying is you don't like them. Well, you know, uh, we, you know, we, you, uh, I don't know what's what he's going through. Be diligent to preserve unity. Tend to it carefully. Amen. We must grow in this because if we can't be one and in step with each other, we ain't getting improper vernacular. We ain't getting nothing done. <laughs> right? Ain't nothing getting done. <laughs> so a growing church also needs help from some willing parts to help growth continue. So what you'll find in this next part of Ephesians is that there's a few people, about five categories, giftedness that says, it's almost like Paul says, hey, by the way, you people who are gifted in this area, who are called in this part of the body, you have a greater responsibility to help make this happen. And guess what? I'm one of them. It's like if you have the privilege to influence, touch people, serve people, you're one of them. And here's part of the challenge in the church. I want to do and have authority and have a voice and make decisions, but you ain't willing to do what is necessary to help someone else. You just want to do what you want to do in the church. You want to just walk down the street with everybody else and just cross it. Got opinion about everything. Well, this should be done this way. This should be done this way. But you don't want to help. Well, I think that could be done better. Help. Couldn't it be this novel idea that God is showing you something that you should be seeing so you can do what? It gets really that, that deep. It's like God is, I always like to tell people, 
the body of Christ and the functionality of the body and the headship, the lordship, the, and how we should handle things, it's so simple, it's deep. If he's showing you the problem, do something about it. This is why you're needed. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16 gives it to us. The first is found in verse 11 and part of verse 12. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So if you people, if you see people in the church who are not equipped, if you see things, some work that needs to be done, bingo. Could I be someone who is called to do the equipping? But then you may say, well, I'm not equipped. Well, get equipped. Can I give you another novel idea today, church? I personally had to get equipped. I personally have to study to show myself approved under God, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly divide the word of truth. I personally had to go buy books to read, to study, to learn more, to grow. I didn't have Google to, I had to, books. <laughs> I had to read books, pages, you know, like I had to read Then something came over me and said, you probably need to even get more equipped. So I went back to school to get formally equipped. Then I went back to school to get more equipped. Then I went back to school to get more equipped. And I go still today, I go to conferences to get more equipped. Or to stay re equipped. It's never one and done. It's never you just come to know Jesus, you read a few verses. No, think about this. If you're a parent today, can you imagine if you just never learned how to cook? Your, your children would be like starving to death. Not saying you got to be the best cook, but you know how to cook something. It's no different than a child becomes an adult. She grows up. She leaves the house. You're going to figure out how to boil hot dogs or something. Make peanut butter jelly sandwiches yourself. If not, you will starve to death. Somebody has to be the adult in the room. And says, I care enough about God's people that I will grow up to help somebody just as I have been helped. And that's why if you look at this, again, the first point is you need to equip others for ministry. We need people who understand that you are needed to equip people for ministry. It says, for the equipping of the saints. The word equipping means to complete, to bring someone to a complete furnishing. Have you ever moved into the house and you're like, I, I probably need like a bedroom set, but, but right now you just have a mattress? Amen. I've been there. Listen, when I got married, Lisa completed me. Not merely just, oh, I have a wife, but she completed me because, you know, when she first met me, I had one bowl, one fork. One spool, one plate, one set of sheets, no decoration, zero. I was just a single dude saying, hey, I'll wash the sheets. I guess when they start standing up by themselves or something. <laughs> right? But she comes in and says, uh, ain't going to work that way anymore. Add decoration, beauty. 
be up, pictures on the wall, etc. Right? So equipping. So there's this responsibility that, that one has to equip others for ministry. Ministry what? For service are those who help meet needs by either collecting or distributing charities. Can you imagine in the church how charitable deeds are so important? Gathering, distributing, gathering, distributing, gathering, distributing. If no one is equipping people, there is no distributing, there is no gathering. Then people's needs go unmet. There's this responsibility to completely furnish the church with gifted servants. That's your responsibility. Some of you in this room, because it says some are, some of you in this room are called by God to equip others for ministries so that this church is furnished with gifted servants, period. But then you also find this in the latter part of verse 12, Ephesians 4, it says, for the building up of the body of Christ. So you have this equipping for ministry, but then you have someone else who is needed to do what? Build up the body, okay? There are people in this church that are equipped to build up the body. And again, if you're not equipped, your responsibility is to do what? Go get equipped. And the beautiful thing that we have in our church is we have an entire equip process. For the building up of the body. The words building up means this, to edify or the edification of the body. To edify the body, to edify, edify for the edification of the body. The word edification is defined by Oxford Dictionary this way, moral and intellectual instruction. So your responsibility is to help build up the body that it is morally and intellectually maturing. That we are men and women who are living out our salvation. We are doing who and what he says we are to do and be. And there are people who are supposed to come alongside to provide that instruction of, are you doing, how do I know if I'm doing what I'm supposed to do? You're needed to build the moral and intellectual muscles of the body of Christ. Can you imagine that? Envision that, right? Because we're the body of Christ. Someone is called and responsible to build the muscle content of the body of Christ. Then you find number three in, verses, in verse 13. It says, until we all attain what? The unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. So here we find that the knowledge of the Son of God is connected some way creatively to what? The unity of the faith. So what you do in the local church is needed to attain what? Unity, which we said is a very important functioning part of a church growing in what? Oneness. So how, think about that for a minute. There are people in this church who are responsible to, to rise above and say, follow me as I follow Christ, who sits in a meeting with, let's say, people who maybe aren't. And let's say those people who are not are now causing disunity. Because that's what happens. Let's say you had an engaged group in somebody's house and gossip starts simmering around the snacks. Somebody's got to step up and say, nah, not on my watch. You follow me? Somebody's got to step up and say, oh, not on my watch. Do you understand what is happening here? So again, you're needed to attain unity. And remember, it says attain unity attain because as a church is growing and you get new people added and things like that and people have to get adjusted to the culture and the DNA of the church and things like that. So as people are added, there's always this continuing of attaining unity because we really don't fulfill unity until we see the head of the church face to face. There's always this attaining to Right? And we're going to read a passage of scripture that alludes to that when we conclude. So, but this word attain means this to arrive to. So, we have people in this church whose responsibility to, is to help us arrive at unity. Making sense. Arrive at unity. 
where unity means this, is so special, that there's this agreement of the faith. You may have your opinion, you may have your opinion, I may have my opinion, but guess what we're going to agree to? Faith in Jesus. Make sense? You know, you, you may be from this culture, this community, you may be of this age or that age, or you may be whatever. You may come into the body of Christ with great pain and disillusionment, disillusion, delu- you know what I mean? Being disillusioned, you know, just confused because of, you know, your past experiences, and then you come into your church and you bring it there. You, you bring, listen, you bring in your trauma, your pain from marriage or from parents. It causes the lens to be confused. The lens in which we look at the scriptures to become confusing. But what unconfuses us is unity of the faith. And when when a people agree to who Christ is, the head of the church, the head has a unique way of aligning the body the way it should be aligned. So whenever you get to a point, it's like, no, 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 okay, yeah, you may think pre-trib, post-trib, pre-millennial, amillennial, and you probably be saying, what in the world are those names? Google it. <laughs> but but, but it, which says the church is on all different spectrums. Well, I think he's coming before the tribulation. Well, I think he's coming post-tribulation. Well, I think he's, I think he's, Okay, but do we know that Jesus Christ came to die for all nations and tribes and tongues? Yes. Do we agree that he's the head of the church? Let's all submit to that. And when we submit to that, then we start agreeing to other things. Make sense? So we, we have this responsibility to attain unity, but then you... you you have uh, two more that we can define in these verses. Verses 13 and 14 uh, gives us our fourth way that you are desperately needed uh, to help the church continue to grow in oneness. Verse 13 and 14, it says, Until we attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, it says, To the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ, As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by trickery of people, by craftiness and deceitful schemings. You hear that? So so you're needed to help develop maturity. I don't know if you remember, but Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and says... um, There are too many children that are among you right now. By this time, there should be more adults. I did a study on that. And it was about, uh, theologians would say, and commentaries and research would say, from the first and the second letter is between three to five years. So it's almost like saying, hey, you've been walking with Christ for at least five years now, why are you still acting like a child? More specifically, what Paul is saying is, you should be multiplying right now. Why are you bearing? You follow me? Why aren't you having children of the faith right now? Why are not people calling you and you still calling people for help. You've been in the faith for three to five years. Why are you still acting like a child? Why are you still having childlike tendencies? What's wrong? You should be mature by now. You should be 
sharing your faith and knowing how to share your faith. You should be knowing how to study the scriptures and read the scriptures and find answers for yourself. Why can't you? What's wrong with you? That's pretty much what Paul was saying is, what's wrong with you? Because all of your bickering and fighting and doing all these things, you're acting like little children right now. Where's the adults in the room? So my challenge to you as well is where, where are the adults in the room? Just quickly add up how many years you've been walking with Christ. Who can call you a mother in the Lord? Who can call you a big sister in the Lord? A big brother, a father in the Lord. That's how practical it is, church. If nobody in this church is ringing your phone saying, hey, I need your help, I'm wrestling with this. There's two things that's wrong. Either we don't have enough babies, and I think we have enough babies. You follow what I'm saying? New believers, new converts are young in the faith. Or you're still acting like a child. Who's calling you? Who's calling you saying, hey, can you pray for me? Because I don't know what to do. Who's calling you saying, hey, you know, I'm really struggling with this and uh, can you show me a Bible verse that can kind of help me with this? Right, because that's what a child does when they need mama or daddy, right? They blow mama's phone up and like, mama, help me, I'm good, you know? But once they wean themselves off, it's funny that mama feels some kind of way because they now don't call anymore, right? But that's a part of Maturity. Let's say that you're part of a group that there's a bunch of mature, quote, mature people in the group. Do you know it's extremely immature of that group to not have immature people in the group? Because it's short sighted. It's not gospel-centered. It's not these things I give to you, you give to a faithful few, they give to others. It's short-sighted. So therefore, like when we re-engage with engaged groups, so you're going to hear more about that in the coming months or so, we start re-engaging with engaged groups. Worst thing that engaged group could have is a bunch of heady people in the group. It's prideful, it's arrogant, and it's self-fulfilling. Think about this. There's a, I don't think there's a mother on the planet who has a child who says, so when you going to have, and they get married, they get married, and they say, so when you have babies? That's one of, like, one of the first questions that a mother especially, okay, so when you going to start being fruitful and multiply? You married now, when you go, you right? <laughs> when you guys expect to have kids, did, did they come back to you? Well, we're gonna wait about three or five years. What? You wait that long? <laughs> that, that's a different generation. When I was a kid, we, you got married, you just got right. So the generation of the church is simply you come to know Jesus, you start bearing fruit. When you come to know Jesus, All you need to know is this. Once I was blind, but now I see. In other words, I see what's happening in your life. And the answer for my life has been Jesus. That's the only intelligible answer that you need. Is that I don't know what you're thinking or what you're saying or whatever your approach has been. But can I tell you what has happened to me? I met this dude named Jesus, and he changed my life. That's all you need to hang your hat on. And you'll begin to bear fruit like you've never seen before in your life. Maturity. 
And we are responsible to bring people to, listen, this word maturity, brought to its end, finished, wanting nothing, necessary to completion. In other words, there are people in this church that is required, it is necessary for you to help people come to completion. It also means this perfect man, consummate human integrity and virtue, full grown men and women. That's what we're called to bear. Lastly, you're needed to maintain the standard. Everything I just spoke, everything that is written, verse 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ, for whom the whole body is being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causing the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So it's almost like he identifies these key five groups, but then he comes back and says, oh, by the way, every joint, every individual part, just in case you try to weasel yourself out. Because that's the human tendency. Well, okay, I'm not you, pastor. No, you're not me, but you're you. I will never be you. And I would like to tell you and beseech you today, there are people in your life that I will never have the privilege to reach, but you can. There's friends, families, neighbors, coworkers. There's people in your life that I will never be able to entertain with a gospel message, but you can. We are responsible to maintain this standard together that there is this working. Listen to, it says, last key word, the proper, that's the word, working of each individual parts. That's what we're talking about today. This word proper means this, the rule or the standard of judgment. In other words, there is a standard in which God is placed in the church. And he's not going to change it based upon what you feel, I feel, what you think, I think, based upon if you feel inadequate or adequate. He's not going to change the standard. But we can reach the standard together. He has put a plumb line, like he said about Jerusalem, in the midst. He has put a measuring rod in the midst that he's not going to change, church. But the only way that we're going to be able to maintain this by working together and being as one as he and the Father is one. Make sense? And that's why I want to eat in with these words that Paul wrote to the church of Philippi in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 through 21. Listen, brothers and sisters, I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet. But one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind, and I reach forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, all who are mature, let's have this attitude. And if anything, you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you as well. However, let's keep living by the same standard to which we have attained Brothers and sisters, join in my following, in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I've often told you and now tell you even as I weep that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite and whose glory is in their shame who have their minds on earthly things. What category are you? This is who we are. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our lowly condition into conformity with his glorious body by the exertion of the power that he has even 
to subject all things unto himself. You are needed to pursue and always maintain the standard that he set before us. Amen? Amen. So let's keep growing, church. And some of you must start getting engaged to help the church grow even more into the oneness that Christ died for. Some of you need to get involved to help the church continue to grow in the oneness that he's called the church to be. Amen? You can do it. Because I was sitting in the back row waiting for the preacher to bow his head so I can leave. That was me. That was me. And one day I forgot about it. Until one day I was speaking somewhere in Delaware and a young man came up to me and said, hey, I remember you. <laughs> he said, you used to go to the same church as I did in Philly. He said, really? He said, yeah, you used to sit in the back row. When the pastor said, let's pray, you would, you would dodge out and leave. And what he didn't know was I was a young preacher at that time as a pastor of a church and I was so livid and mad at people who did me that way. And the Lord says, don't forget, you were that person in the back row. Don't you ever forget that I can change a person's heart and move them from the back row to the front of the stage. So don't, don't count yourself out. You do not let the enemy trick you to make you think you have no value, you have no place. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And that's just a short version of my story. Okay? Jesus Christ died so you could be a functioning part of his church. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that we're your church and the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. We're your church as well, God, and you have called us all to be a part of it. Thank you for joining us here at Commitment Online, a place for all nations. If you're ever in the Philadelphia, Delaware, or South Jersey region, we hope to see you in person. But for now, please tune in next week here at Commitment Online.